Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast, where I bring you the best and the writers from the world of business, marketing, and entrepreneurship to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. My guest today on the podcast is Megan Riley, owner and COO of Tippy Toes, an internationally franchised company bringing a unique program of dance and creative movement to child care centers, schools, playgroups, and various after-school programs. And Megan has run Tippy Toes alongside her sister, Sarah, since 1999, when Sarah founded the company as a way to support herself after getting fired from her job as a waitress. I love how these things happen. And today, Megan is a speaker, podcaster, and soon-to-be author who shares her message and interviews other mothers through her, quote, Who Is Your Mama show. And they've also appeared on Shark Tank, where they were offered three, right, three separate deals. Mm-hmm. with, uh, yeah. with, And they briefly accepted a deal with Mark Cuban, which is interesting, and we'll talk about that. But there's so much more. And I had a pleasure to meet Sarah a couple months back in New York. She's amazing, and I can't wait to get into it, so let's do it. Megan, I meant Megan, not Sarah. Megan, welcome to the podcast. (laughs) What's up, Adam? I'm pumped to be here. Uh, Thanks for having me. And I love that you use the word tenacity when you intro your podcast. I love that that's a focus. Tenacity to me is like my favorite thing, most important thing. I love it. If and when I ever get a um, one of those tattoos on the inside of my lip, it would be tenacity. (laughs) Or I've been thinking about getting knuckle tattoos. And that's probably what it would say across him, because that word that word means that word means so much. So let's so let's reverse it, and I will literally start with my last question: What does tenacity mean to you, Megan? Tenacity is like there is no quit. There is no quit. There is no. Uh, there is no. Um, nothing I won't do. Nothing I'm not willing to do. It's it, it mixes up like hard work, humility um, vision all into one in my, in my opinion, because you have to know where you're going. Like if if you're, you're not tenacious over nothing, you have to have a reason that you're being tenacious. So you've got to have that vision of what you're doing. Then you also have to have the humility because there's going to be a lot of times if you want to build something cool, that Mm -hmm. you're going to be changing the trash. You're going to be getting, you know, yelled at by a customer. You're going to be whatever, like changing the proverbial diapers, the duty diapers. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Um, and then you also just have to be, you know, a hard worker ready to put in the, put it, put in the work. You know, we talk about 10,000 hours to become an expert. You talk about like all the things, there's a million different ways it's presented, but at the end of the day, you've got to be ready to show up and do the work. So for me, it's kind of that tenacity, um, encompasses those things, humility, vision, and then the ability, the willingness to do hard work. I love it. Do you think you've always been tenacious in life or has that, has that emerged at a certain point in your life and your career? I would say I've always had some tenacity. I, I I've always been, there's a competitiveness to me and there always has been, I, you know, wanted to, to, I just, I wasn't ever willing to, um, not give everything I had to whatever I was doing, whether that was spelling tests in third grade basketball in high school, you know, whatever <laughs> it was, there've been moments of moments of laps where I haven't done that. And honestly, those have been some of the harder moments for me when I didn't have that tenacity. And then of course those become the life lessons for me that right. I hang on to. Of course. I mean, I, I always say like, we all have it in us, right? There's, there's a tenacity tank, almost like a fuel tank. And it's a matter of when you need to harness it and, and, and knowing those moments. So let's, let's hit the rewind button here for, for people that are not familiar with tippy toes and correct me, keep me straight here. So tippy toes is pretty much founded because of a football game, your sister getting fired from a waitress job and a car payment. Let's put all those pieces together. 100%. What, what's, what's the story there? Help me help, yeah. help help me help you tell the story. Okay. So it, you, I have to say your intro was perfect. And it, you wrapped in like a big story in a very short amount of time. That was very impressive. No one's ever done it quite that cleanly. So well done. Um, yes. Thanks, my so, producer, Chris. Chris, there you go. Nod to you. Yeah. He's also editing now. 
There you go. So good. It is. Um, so yeah. So my sister had a waitressing job. She was a sophomore in college. And at the time we went to the university of Oklahoma, we had some very best, our best friends went to Notre Dame and OU was going to go up to South Bend and play football. And my sister and I were like, we're going, mm. but Sarah had to, uh, she had a, you know, a shift at on the border in Norman, Oklahoma on that Saturday. And she was like, I am not going to come in. And they were like, you have to come in. She's like, no, 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 I'm going to go out of town. And they're like, if you don't come in, you lose your job. And she was Bye. like, mm, are they really going to fire me? Well, they did. Uh, we went, it was amazing. We had a blast. I think, oh, you actually lost, but, um, but anyways, we came back and she had no job and she had just bought a car and my parents, she called my parents and she was like, so I lost my job, but I have this car payment kind of thinking uh -oh. they would like, you know, spot her. How and they were like, mm, sounds like you need to get another job. And so they, you know, they were, it was sink or swim. And so she relied on what she was, what she knew, what was natural for her. And we danced our whole life growing up. And so she thought, okay, well, let me just go into the local daycares, see if I can offer a dance class to just make my car payment. Let me just right. see if I can make that $300 a month or whatever it was at the time. And, um, and it worked. The school said yes. And so then that became like a little side hustle as she was a sophomore in college. And then over the next couple of years, it grew into when she graduated, she could, she was just trying to get her diploma so she could get back to tippy toes. Like she didn't care. She hated school. Um, and she just wanted to be able to do tippy toes. And over the course of her working part-time in college, it became something that could sustain her when she graduated. Now it wasn't anywhere near it, whereas today, but right. it grew out of that. That's how it started. So uh, nice. she's a few years older than I am. So I came to school when she was a senior. And so when I came, then I started doing the same thing as she did, went to different areas, went to different schools, taught dance. And then it just kind of, it really organically grew from there. I mean, it's always crazy. I mean, I love to talk to founders. I'm like, was, was there that one moment? Was it over a beer at a bar with your partner? You're like, where did that spark come from? And this comes from, you know what, making a decision to go to a football game and quitting, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and quitting and not going back to it and never looking back. But so the question to you, I mean, ha did you always were you kind of pushed into it? Were you, were you, were you, what was drawn to you to go into the quote family business? I mean, was there something else that you really wanted to do? So I actually went to school to become a registered dietitian. And that was really though, I'm, I'm there's a major pragmatic component to me. So I was like, if I'm going to go to school, I like, I, I, I knew I wanted to speak. I knew I wanted, hmm. I liked health and nutrition. I was very much into sports. I didn't really know when I was going to school, what I was going to do very quickly after I was there. I, um, when I started doing, you know, I mean, I got my, I got my master's degree in, in, in science. I am a registered dietitian. Uh, you know, I, I went through with all of that and I right. enjoyed it, but there was pretty early on, I would say probably my sophomore year of, of college, I knew I wasn't really going to be a practicing registered dietitian, um, because what? I loved, why not? I loved what, yeah, I loved what I was doing as an entrepreneur. And that was after, you know, my freshman year of, of, of college going around and teaching and, and I, I didn't, it didn't have a boss. I, I loved that. I loved the creativity and I was making money. It was kind of one of those things where I was like, Oh, yeah, this and pause, is fun. I'm pausing that for a second, just to give everyone a timestamp here. And I'm not trying to date you, but we're talking early two thousands, right? Yes. So, so I graduated high school in 2001. So okay. this was 2001, 2002, 2003. Right. That, so you know, I, entrepreneurship mm -hmm. was not this sexy thing that we all think of it today. It was not this aspirational kind of goal. Did your parents support this move? Were they like, shit, we, you know, we you know, help, I don't know if they help you with, you know, college and everything. And, you know, we, we paid all this money, all this education, everything. And, you know, what's, what's Megan doing here? What are we doing? My parents are one of my secret weapons along with my spouse and my family uh, because they've been supportive from day one. Uh, they, you know, they, they were not entrepreneurs themselves. And, but they've always, I, I thought I could do anything because my parents always told me that. And so then when I mm -hmm. realized like some parents didn't do that, I was like, what? Your parents didn't believe in you. That's so weird, you know, because I, I feel the same way, that. right? Like having mm -hmm. nurturing parents is something that I take for granted, but a lot of people mm -hmm. have some real shitty parents and no parents at all. Yeah. 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 And I can't imagine that. So I never, there was never a moment, Adam, never a moment where my parents were like, I don't think you want to do this. There wasn't. Now, having said that, I will say that the way Tippy Toes grew, it was organic and natural. So Sarah was doing this as a part-time job in college, which I, when I talked to college students, I'm like, try stuff. Do it now, especially when mom and dad are paying the bills. Or try, whatever every, it might be. try everything. Yes. Literally try and everything. They, yeah. And we were lucky and fortunate that our parents were paying for our life when we were in college. But when we were in those years, we were trying to build a business and it worked. So then honestly, th that made it never feel like a huge, scary thing. Because by the time Sarah graduated, she was making 
a good living, you know, and I was still going to go crazy. through school and I continued to go through school for a while longer. Cause I still, I, I also always wanted to be um, like, you know, if I, if I was a registered dietitian, I could find a job. I could have, you know, it always right. felt like it was, it was almost logical. a safety net, right? It was almost a safety yeah. net. Like it was one of those yeah. professions. So when you were, when you were watching your sister grow this business, I mean, was there a, a, a moment, a couple of moments of like, almost critical, critical failure or some of these like really hard lessons that she had to learn in those early days of the business? You know, I, there were little, yes, not nothing big though, because again, like I, there's a term in, um, I think it's in rework. I need to double check because I love this idea is shoot, shoot, BB, shoot BBs before you fire cannon. That whole idea. So really for the beginning years, it was a part-time gig for Sarah. So she wasn't relying on it. She didn't need this big income. It was, she could figure out a lot of the issues when it was still small and, and her livelihood wasn't writing on it. So, right. but I do sandbox. remember one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember, um, I was sitting on her duplex floor one day and, and she had just gotten reamed by a parent who was so mad. They missed, like we had all those moments where the customers get mad and they're like, why don't you have a newsletter? And it was like, <laughs> Oh, you're right. We should have a newsletter. Okay. But like, so it's those little lessons, but also very big ones. Like you learn how to work with people. You learn how to serve people. You learn how to deliver for people. And then that translates, those lessons don't change. Like it nope. doesn't really change whether it's, we're talking about customer a service job and college. managing expectations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a million dollar deal with some customer or a mom paying, you know, 60 bucks a month for dance classes. It's the same Concept. And, and let's talk about that. I mean, you want to talk about customer service. I mean, I live in the burbs here. I've had my daughter in gymnastics and dance, and I've seen some of these moms and dads. I've seen them get feisty with the uh, the 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 owners and operators of these businesses. Talk about tough customers. Anything involving moms and kids? You know, we our our approach. We are a kid. It's kid friendly. It's fun. It's not competitive. No. It is. You know, it is a happy place. We are focused on building the kids' confidence. So honestly, when people come to us, they're looking for a good time. They're looking for fun. They're looking for happiness. Have we had upset parents for different things? A thousand percent. But I always kind of go back to this isn't brain surgery. Anything that happens, we can usually fix. We this can adjust it. We can, you know, address it. Yeah. So there have been times when people come to us at a hundred hundred degrees and they are ready yep. to rip our face <laughs> off. And I mean, I was that happened to me when I was 19. You know, so for me, I remember early on, it was always like, okay, I understand, you know, like I just handled it like I knew how to handle it from, you know, how I was raised or whatever. Um, but now it doesn't phase me at all. I know that to me, when that happens, if somebody comes to you like that, I'm like, man, there's something going on for them. Yeah. Something so, inside for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we diffuse it pretty quickly. There are conversations we have with franchise owners many times, because a lot of times people aren't prepared for that. But when that happens, it doesn't happen that much just because of the nature of our business, people are paying, you know, for a once a weekly dance class, 45 minutes, once a week, we're not saying you're going to go on to Broadway. We're saying your child's going to come to us. They're going to have fun. They're going to learn concepts of dance, but they're going to feel confident. They're going to gain friendships and that's what you're going to get from and, us. And so they're going to see if the they like tone. it. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a tone. Yeah. And, 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 and that's... not everybody's going to love it, you know, no. and we're okay with that. And when somebody comes to us and, and they're like, you know, we, they, they might not like what we're doing. It's like, okay, super. We aren't for everybody. We are for people that want to give dance a try, want to learn like, but then what's cool is you get what you what you put into it. So we have some kids that are with us for years. They learn all sorts of choreography and technique and it's amazing. And it's fun. But the bottom line is this is to build their confidence, to have them have fun. And so I think honestly, Adam, that helps us avoid some of those like horror stories you hear from, you know, dance moms. Like we don't uh, really experience that to that degree. It's because it happens. But no, it's and I mean, it's, 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 it's a different type of dance school. I mean, my daughter is now in competitive dance and it's a whole different ball game mm -hmm. when they're trying to coordinate competitions and the politics mm -hmm. and don't even get me started with the whole COVID thing over the last couple of years. It's been mm -hmm. crazy. So let's mm -hmm. shift a little bit. I want to talk about Shark Tank. Did did you guys apply for the show or did the producers come to you guys? Tell us a little bit about that story. My brother-in-law uh, sent in an application without my sister and I knowing. <laughs> so we did apply, but we had no idea we applied if that can, if you can believe that. So we watched thanks. season one. No, thanks, and thanks. Back, back in the day, there was no business show. So Shark Tank comes on the, on the scene and we're like, this is amazing. Yeah. I love that. I can't believe there's like an entertainment show about business. All of a sudden it felt like these are my people. This is so cool. Um, but if you remember like shark tank season one was kind of watched, but not that watched, but no. we were all over it. So my brother-in-law, so my sister would watch it and her husband, my husband and I would watch it. We lived apart. We never lived in the same place. And, um, and then like 
eight months later or something like that, we, Sarah gets a phone call. It's like, Hey, these are, you know, we're shark tank. We want to talk to you about having you on the show. Sarah gets off the phone and she calls and she's like, they found shark tank reached out, they like thinking, thinking they were like searching for us. And we were like this golden goose for them. When really we turns out, she called her husband and he was like, yeah, I'm glad they got the application. And she was like, what are you talking about? So he submitted it. Um, we wanted to be on it, but we didn't ever apply it. My, my brother-in-law did it without us knowing. And then, um, and then we got the call and we started working with him and, and it was, it was a blast. That's incredible. So let's, let's talk about the actual experience. What did you guys do to prep to be on the show? There's a lot of prep work in Shark Tank. People don't see that, right? People it. people come on oh, there yeah. and there's an insane amount that you... Ha- I, I had a buddy that was on it and the, the amount of work that, that you have to do because they want mm-hmm. you to be prepared to the, you know, as much as humanly possible. Yeah, they do their due diligence. They make sure they're, you know, the business is on there, have their P's and Q's and, you know, all the, you know, uh, I's dotted and T's crossed. So there's that part of it. But you're also, we were working with the... Now, keep in mind, we were season two. So it's been like 10 years. Um, but back then, uh, we we worked with the producer, a couple of producers for a few months leading up to the show where they were working with us on our pitch, kind of helping us through things, asking us questions. That's a bolt of it. The whole time, we never knew if we were going to get actually get to go to LA. They, they never guarantee you anything. They don't have to, they're the TV show. They're, you know, producing entertainment. So at no point did we know we were going until like, I want to say two or three days before they said, oh, wow. you're, you're booked. Here's your tickets. You're coming to LA and you'll be here for a week. And then once you get there for the week, you still don't know if you're going to get in front of the sharks. And if you get in front of the sharks, you still don't know if you're going to get aired. So the whole time you're on the ropes, you don't, you don't know what's going on, but God, but what's that, what's that pressure like? What's that stress like? You know, um, it, Early on, I was stressed, really, really stressed. I was overwhelmed. I was stressed. I'm still running a business, by the way. Like, mm-hmm. this is a whole separate thing that we're still running tippy toes and it's going great. We have, like, at that point, we just started franchising. We had seven franchises. It was, we're but, still doing all that. But let's talk economics for a moment. Did, did you need the funding at that point? Or was it more for exposure, for brand exposure? So we, we, we wanted funds, but we were going there not to talk about franchising. We were going there cause we wanted, this will tell you how long ago it was. We wanted to have children's DVDs made of our dance classes so kids could dance at home. Mm-hmm. So that's what the, that's what the funding was for. That's what we wanted. We wanted them to help us produce right. this. We wanted to be the next Barney. That's what, and we still do to be perfectly honest with you. We, we have, we, that's what, one of the things that we're still going to do. Um, but yeah, that's what we went there for. Now that quickly shifted when the sharks heard about our franchising business they were like don't even talk to us about the dvds ever again we will i think mr wonderful said he would shock us with a with a like a you know ankle bracelet Uh uh-huh um they wanted all in on the franchising so that so on the fly in the shark tank we shifted that conversation as as they were like no no no, no, we're not going to talk about that we were like okay what do you want to talk about (laughs) no i know a little behind the scenes here They, they do a lot of editing on those on those shows do they give you a moment to chat with your sister like do they give you like could you do like a like a timeout like we just have a quick sidebar over here yeah so there's no actual timeout the cameras are always on uh we were in there for an hour and you see eight minutes so in our episode we went out to the hallway you don't ever see us going out to the hallway um i remember we had a camera like right here right next to our face and and we were out in the hallway trying to do math Adam, I couldn't have added two plus two together at that what point. So I pressure. covered my mouth and I'm like mumbling to Sarah. So only she could hear it. Cause I was like, I cannot have this on national television no. being like, what's 10% of 300,000. Yeah, I was like, trying to figure I it have out. no yeah. idea right now. Like I couldn't, I couldn't have do ever you, put those thoughts together. Do you, do you think, and I'm it's just kind of coming to my head. Like, is that like a, a real handicap disadvantage for anyone coming on the show where like the pressure is so high that these sharks are going to take advantage of somebody? Right. Because the lights are on, the pressure's on. I mean, this is your livelihood. This is your business. You're, some folks are about to give away X amount of equity and, 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 and you know, stake in their company. And you're like, shit, I got to do this crazy math. Uh, Cuban or, or, or Lori or one of these people trying to give me all this money. But how much do they want? Is this worth it? Like, that's crazy to have to make that kind of decision that quickly. Yeah. Here's the thing, though, is nobody had forced me there. You know, like there were a million exits before I got to that point in the hallway. And so. Yeah, it's hard. It's really, it's a, it's a, um, you know, a challenge for your mm-hmm. brain. It, it doesn't feel good. It feels like there you are on the, on the hot seat, but also someone's willing to give you a ton of money. So like, oh, yeah. it's kind of like put up or shut up. Like if you don't, if you, so yes, I mean, I think, it, sword, it, of course. I, I think it puts you on your heels, but also there, first of all, 
I also think it's really important for people to never forget they're producing a television show. Right. There's so an entertainment factor to it. Their number one priority is right. not for my family's livelihood to thrive. Their number one and, priority is to make a really good TV show. And, and I never and, forgot and that. And the producers are very clear. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. My buddy had the experience where the producers are very clear about all, all of this going into it. There's a lot of legal paperwork going into it. There's a lot of diligence. And at the end of the day, they're very clear. Like, this is a, sh this is a show. Like, and, and, and so they've in the past, and, and I want to hear about your experience, they've made offers before. And then they rescinded them or you're able to back out at a certain point, like once you get to due diligence. But what happened? Did, did Cuban, Cuban made you an offer on the show? Yeah. So Cuban ended up making us an offer on the show. We were thrilled. We were pumped. We hug him, high five, run out the hallway. Life right. was good. Right. And we go back and we communicate with him here and there. It was great. He was so receptive, so kind, sent back emails back. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we're also working with his team on working through the contract and those kinds of things. And, you know, at the time of the Shark Tank, we'd never seen a contract with him. It's not like we knew any terms. We didn't know anything other than right. equity, dilution, all this yes. and that and shares and, and Nothing. conversion I mean, you know, and yeah. no other details. And so there were just a few things in that negotiation that we wanted to adjust. And there was, um, that wasn't something that was going to happen. They were not going to make any, many, any concessions, which again, he holds the cards. He doesn't have to make any concessions, but we don't also, we don't have to sign the deal if we don't feel good about that. And so we didn't feel good about it. We didn't, we wanted, we tried to negotiate. We wanted to make it work. It didn't work. We walked away. Um, and you know, he wasn't, he wasn't happy about it, but also like, I've never regretted it. I, good. you know, one of those things where there's a could, what could have been, I've not spent one, any time wondering you can't what could have, have those been. regrets. Yeah. Hey everybody. First, I'd like to thank you all for spending time with me and my guest on the podcast. This show is my canvas to showcase amazing people from the world of recruiting, entrepreneurship, and leadership, and unpack their career journeys for everyone to learn from. But this show is also a business generator for me, as well as creating thought leadership and endless amazing content. And I've taken what I've learned in the past three years and over 200 recorded and 100 live shows and distilled it down into a digital playbook that I call the Pause Course. Now you could learn how I build, manage, and produce the podcast and use it to drive real business development and relationships. Today, I'm sharing all of my secrets behind the podcast, and you can get it all at thepausecourse.com. This course is for anyone, whether you're starting out or an advanced podcast, you're using it for B2B, a B2C. It's filled with all of my insights, learnings, tips, tricks, and templates. So get it now at thepausecourse.com and learn all my secrets. Thanks. So let me ask you a question. What did, what did you learn from Mark Cuban himself during that experience? Um, I would say, I mean, I was, I was amazed that he got back to our emails and I remember how much that Heard made that about me him. feel seen and important from him. Um, cause I was like, I'd get an email back from him quickly and I was like, wow. And I, I think I remember thinking you're never too. You know, I, I think there's a part sometimes where I think like, oh, once you get to a certain place, you kind of keep everybody at arm's length. And he didn't. He was he was, you know, he responded. And I, I thought that was great. Um, and then I also think one of the things I learned from that whole experience is you have to know what you care about most in your life, because if you don't know, you're going to find yourself really confused, really hurt, really pissed, really you know, upset at a certain point, because you're going to make decisions not based on what you really want, you know, and, and so for us. One of the things that we were going to be losing was some autonomy and ability to create things Control. we wanted to outside of franchising. And I knew that if I couldn't, if I was just, if my one job was going to be go to go sign franchise agreements, that was going to rip my soul out. I was never somebody that wanted to just go sign agreements. Now, does it sound fun to grow tippy toes? Yeah, but like I can't just be someone going around pushing pushing these contracts it's not, across tables. No, it's not it's, me. It's, it's not you. And no. so, you know, but, that was one of the determining factors. And I needed to know what I cared most about. I cared about my flexibility. I cared about me being able to create. And so, um, you know, that helped me walk away from $100,000 because I was like, am I willing to give that up? $100,000 comes and goes. $100,000 cannot be my motivation. It cannot change who I am. $100,000 money comes. It's an outcome. It's mm -hmm. not a motivation. I love and that. so those are, the, those are the things that really made an impact for me when we were making that decision. That's smart. So let's talk about decision making. Let's talk about franchising. Was that always part of the plan? Was it always expansion to share the story, to share the experience? No, not at all. <laughs> it was, I mean, we always wanted to expand. I didn't know what franchising was in 2005. I mean, I, I, I knew McDonald's did it and it worked out for them, but like, I didn't, I, there was no grand plan. I have no business background in that. I knew nothing, but 
uh, before Shark Tank, we also, we were trying to, like I said, we were trying to produce this children's television show. We were working with some people in LA, putting some money, some energy mm-hmm. into the idea of producing a television show. Well, after about a year of working with them, we go out to LA to finally meet them. And it was a complete disaster. We what? did not want to work with them. It what was happened? not what we thought it was. They were, it was just like, they had all these grand plans and all these things that they said they were going to do. And then when you go there and you actually see it, yeah, you're it's like, all bullshit. All smoke and mirrors. This is all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A thousand percent. And so we were like, okay, so we're in LA. We went there for this and we're like, fell flat on our face. It was a hard hell. No, it was mm-hmm. like, that's all wasted. It was nothing. And we're sitting there with a couple of people. And one, one of the people said to us, have you ever thought about franchising? And Sarah and I like, like look at mean? each other and we're like, no, we've never thought about it. And then it, the wheels start turning and you're like, huh. huh? At that point, Sarah and I had both moved from Norman, Oklahoma. I moved to Stillwater. She moved to Kansas city. We took tippy toes wherever we went and we kept it wherever it was. We'd kind of started franchising. You kind of did it without knowing it. Yeah. Without knowing what we're doing. Yeah. And so somebody said that and I was like, man, that's interesting. Let's think about that. And also at that point in my life, I had so many of my friends, I was 24 at the time. I had so many of my friends say to me, God, you're so lucky. You like this flexible job. You can do whatever you want to. You're building your own business. This is so cool. Again, this is still pre it's cool to be an entrepreneur. Um, and I was like, yeah, it's super cool. Like, and I, at that point in my life, I was like, I can't imagine like going into an office or having like time off or like, no, you off. know, whatever. And so, yeah. And so all of that stuff, um, so that was another part of it. I thought, I mean, I know there's friends of mine that like want this opportunity. So that means there's probably other people in the world. So we go home from LA and I buy franchise management for dummies. And I'm like, what? It's a real book. What What is it? It is a real book. It is yellow cover and all. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've got it. Somebody it's like actually my pride and joy now. And, um, and I start reading it and I'm like, okay, FDD, what is this? Okay. What it, you know, I could just start learning and then we get a consultant and we're off to the races. We spend a year preparing, uh, preparing documents and writing down every single thing we do. And, um, and then, and then that's, we sold our first franchise in 2009. Now we've got, you know, 30, 33, I think. And then that's one in, in China. Yeah. Who, who mm-hmm. is this franchise for? Right. Because because a lot of people out there, you know, they, they think about ways to create income. Maybe they have a, you know, a, a nut of cash that they're sitting on um, and they start to look. OK, wow, I see Dunkin Donuts is a profitable franchise. Maybe I'm going to open up a, a Mike Subs or something. Or wait, wait, what is this? A Tippy Toes Dance School? Mm-hmm. Not for everybody. Yeah. Not for everybody. Who's this for? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's for somebody that wants to make an impact in their community, wants to impact the next generation. I think really having a passion for wanting to give something to kids that's positive and happy. And I think that's, that's at the heart of what we do. And I really want people around us that really believe in the mission, which is to bring joy to kids through dance. So that's part of it. But also, um, you know, it's, if you're going to buy a franchise, there has to be some part of you that wants to follow, follow a framework, but then also bring your own genius to the table. And, and that's, um, that's an interesting balance to, to walk, but that is the way to success in franchising. And so, you know, what's really cool about tippy toes is it gives someone flexibility right off the gate, right out the gate, because you don't have to build out a a studio for tippy toes. So the end, so, you know, as you're getting started, you get your feet wet, you get your customer base, you're going to preschools and daycares and community centers. And then many of our franchise owners end up opening a studio a few years later when they've got this established business established name in their town they're making an impact so you know i think it's somebody that wants flexibility in their life i think it's somebody that wants um to make an income for their family to make you know to also build something that they can pass on to their family i think that's really cool and important and i think it's for somebody that wants to make an impact in the next generation i love it that's powerful stuff there so let's switch gears i want to talk about the podcast the who is your mama podcast and i love you know as a fellow podcaster what was the the impetus to start a show? What was that first scratch that you had? That first itch that you had to scratch? Yeah. Well, you know, it was me with tiny little babies. My ki- I've got uh, three kids, nine and under, and I had this like I the entrepreneur spirit was is alive and well in me. But I was also I'm a full time mom. Like I'm, you know, I I wanted to be the one raising the kids. We have no help. We mm-hmm. never have. It's you know I'm I'm all in all the time, and so. I had little babies and I was running tippy toes and that's all I could do, but I could listen to Gary Vee and I could listen to other podcasters that were like talking about building your brand and doing all this. And I was like, I mean, I don't have any headspace to do that, but I was priming myself for when I could actually take action. So, I mean, I have to say a lot of it was Gary Vee in the beginning of like building it. Everybody should have a podcast. You should do the dude. And I'm like, okay, like, okay, what is my, what, what would that be? And then I go back. 
I, yeah, what would that feel like? And, and I know it had to be authentic to who I am. And so here I am raising these kiddos and I'm thinking, you know, obviously, you know, is it going to be about franchising? Is it going to be about building your own business? And I'm like, ah, yeah, yes, you know, maybe. But then I thought, what I really want to know as my kids got older is how can I be the best parent to them? And then what I love to do, I love to read business books. I love to read, you know, Sh- um, Shoe Dog by, you know, Phil Knight, yep. or I love to read, you know, any entrepreneur story. I love to learn from their journey. And so I thought, I want to learn from the moms who have raised amazing people. I start to follow, you know, Jesse Itzler and Sarah Blakely and, and Gary V. And, and I'm like, it's just dawned on me. Like, I want to be a better parent than what I, than what I would just do on my own. And why would I not go to the experts? Well, who's a parenting expert? Sure. There's researchers and, you know, good research papers, but also I know. Let's talk to real moms. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's talk, talk to, to real moms. Let's talk to real and, moms. Mm-hmm. People want real stories. And it's kind of the funny thing too. When I when like I remember and I and I loved your, your take on this, like when when my daughter, my my eldest, I people were like recommending like 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 birthing books and parenting books. And I'm like, I don't want to read any of that shit. I just want to experience mm-hmm. it and we'll figure this thing out. Did cavemen mm-hmm. have books on parenting yes. for dummies? Right. right and and that's right, really the right. advice I give anyone. I like when people ask for parenting advice, I say, the only advice I'm gonna give you before you have your first kid is get as much sleep as possible. That's it. Yeah. And and yeah. Go, go at it and and that's it. Yeah. And you know, the other thing that I love about my podcast is the proof is in the pudding. If you want to know, if you want to take this lady's advice, go look up her kids Mm -hmm. and then you make the judgment. You decide, do you think she's got chops? Do you think she's got tips? You might be able to help. Well, you know, like I think Sarah Blakely's mom did a pretty good job. Sarah Blakely, you know, we all know who Sarah Blakely is and not as many people know her brother Ford started a company called Zingle and sold it for $42 million. Yeah. So the DNA is pretty, pretty good. What the hell did her parents do? Pretty pretty good. I'll tell you, I watch, I I love watching Jesse's Instagram with those kids Mm -hmm. and their craziness in that house and the way they (laughs) raise them there. And you could see that parenting come down. I mean, I I, I listened to the show where you had, where you had Jesse's, uh, with Sarah's mom on and then you, you could see it. And I yeah. see it myself, the way I parent my kids, the way my mm-hmm. parents parented me, like mm-hmm. it, it's, it, it, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. No, no. And you know what? It's, in, it's changed how I've parented talking to these moms. And the other thing that I, it's my very favorite thing is nobody is talking to these women. No one is picking their brain. No one is saying, what did you do? How did you feel? Why did you do that? What did that mean? What did you, nobody's did you, did you get them. Gary's mom? Did you try? You're trying. Did... I've tried. I've tried. Come I've on. Tried. We know, we know people. We know people. Uh-huh. Yeah. I would love to. I you mean, and I know people who know people. Yeah. 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 I have tried. I've talked to, I've talked, I, I, you know, it's like Instagram message. Um, and so I, I hope, I hope to someday, but um, but you know what else has been really cool is it's fun to have people that are well known, but it's also been like I've had some moms who nobody knows their kids other than the fact their kids are awesome. Like maybe one of my guests, her all of her five kids played college sports, and they're all like you know doctor, you know they're all just amazing people, and they're happy and they're fulfilled and they give back and they do all this. Her story was incredible, and so like and us parents, like yes, it's nice to have a Gary Vee, Sarah Blakely was great, Colin O'Brady's mom, Jay Williams, Kyler Murray. Like mm-hmm. I've had a lot of really great parents that the kids are well known but um but also when it gets down to the nitty-gritty what also i've learned oh i've had d-rock's mom too d-rock's mom's not she was amazing um but also parenting is like the most um it's like the level playing field when we are all in it we've all you have to have the humility you have to have Mm -hmm. the patience your kids don't give a damn if they're gonna make you look bad challenge you and so like there's this eating playing field of like no matter who you are all of us parents can relate to these messages so that's i love it so much who uh you you literally answered my next question you know who who's your who's your dream mom that you would love to have on the show besides gary v's mom yeah. De- okay. So definitely Gary V. Um, there's, there's a lot. I would love to have, um, Sue Bird's mom. Um, she is awesome. I love her. Uh, Candace Parker. I'd love to have her mom. Uh, so those are my, my athletes that I've thought of. Um, Elaine Welteroff. She is one that I would love to have. She is, um, just an icon in the fashion industry and I'd love to talk to her mom. Um, I mean, I've got a really long list of moms. I'd like to say Matt Damon's mom is another one. I feel like, I feel like they're accessible too. And those are some tricks to the trade too. Like how do we go about accessing, you know, these people's moms, which is, which is kind of, what what would you say is what, what's like one story that completely shocked you that you had no idea was coming? I mean, it's, it's probably the most, most well-known one, but I did not see it coming. It, it totally, honestly, like solidified why I'm doing the podcast and it changed how I'm parenting. It was when Ellen Blakely 
said Sarah would come to me. She said she would she would come to me and she'd say she was bored. And I would look at her and I would say, you've got toys, go figure it out. And all of a sudden, I was like, my mind blew. Because like, in theory, yeah, like I'd like to think you say like, oh, go play outside. But to hear that from her so plainly that like, of course, your kids want you to entertain them. And she was like, no, go figure it out. And then she went on to say, so then Sarah would go. Uh, you know, invent games and go sell things to our friends and go draw pictures and go sell it to their neighbors. And, and then it developed into all of these other things. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh. And so now ever since that conversation in the summers, which I guess it's only been one summer, I act like it's been forever, but we have a week of boredom at our house. Now I always, what's a week of a week bored. of board, a week of boredom. And you talk about that week. I mean, we kind of see it as a week between the end of camp and school starting. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so I do nothing for a week with my kids, nothing. There is no TV. I am not taking you to a camp. I'm not giving you a craft. I am not giving you anything. You have our house, our front yard, our backyard. You've got two sisters. All Go the craft supplies. Out. You have everything in this house. Figure it out. Whatever you want. You do whatever you want to. And I, I do it. I do. Now, I don't just do it that week. And then I'm like, that's it. Okay. Hopefully they're learning it. I now do that all the time. <laughs> like when my kids say I'm bored, they actually don't tell me I'm bored anymore or that they're bored anymore. Oh, you could they're sense so it. annoyed. Oh, because they're just like, I know I'm going to go gr- create something wonderful because I always like feed the line from, from what I learned. But, um, but you know, I, I do it all the time, but I specifically have a week because normally in the summer, I'm like, okay, you're going to go to horse camp. You're going to go to yep. dance camp. You're going to go here. Then we're going to have vacation. Then you'll be back at school. Woo. And it's Ooh, like, well, no, it's all planned out. Again. like no. go, I don't know, go, go build a mud pile. And then they do. And actually the first time we did this, my kids decided to make bracelets and they went and go to sell it to their neighbors, our poor neighbors who have to mortgage their house. And right. um, how many bracelets are they going to buy? Right. Yeah. And then, but then she decided you, to donate it to the a hospital and I'm I mean, like, that's such a valuable lesson is to empower your kids and not just tell them what to do, right? Let them, mm-hmm. let them figure shit out there too. What do you think is the most important lesson you learned as a parent by doing your show? I mean, for me, I mean, I talk about it all the time. Like my podcast is my masterclass. This is, I have folks like yourself on, I have amazing folks and this is how I learn. And I think my business has grown tremendously by having these types of conversations. So what have you learned by doing your show from a parenting perspective? Uh, so much. Uh, probably number one is like, it's going to be fine. Like I, I get in my head too much and sometimes think like, am I going to, are they going to be these, you know, fulfilled and happy and loved uh-huh. and supported? And, you know, and it's like, no, they're just continue to show up for your kids and be there. And I heard that over and over from all the moms. There's a few, you know, threads that I heard time and time again. And one of them was just like, be there, be there for them. And uh-huh. then the other one is enable them for who they are. Like don't try to change your kids or push them into be something else. So, so I would say that. And so it's given me a big, deep breath, Adam. Like I can kind of, I'm like, okay, I'm trying and that's enough. Like if we're trying as parents, that's enough. Right. And and there's so much effort there. So what have you learned? I mean, the last couple of years have been insane with us, you know, for anybody who's not a working parent who, who doesn't have kids and they think it's great that they've been able to work from home. It's been a blessing and a curse. I mean, trying to get mm-hmm. anything done with the kids around there, being productive, keeping your business running, running the household. I mean, have you been managing it? How have you and your husband been managing it? It is so freaking hard, Adam. I mean, just, it's so freaking hard. I've cried more in the past two years, just to be perfectly frank than I did ever before, because there is no break. My kids are just going back to school for the first time one week before Christmas, because I wanted them to be vaccinated before they went to school. They've been home since March, 2020. Um, it has been so hard there, by the way, they're five, seven and nine. Like, it's not like they're self sufficient you know, like it's, I'm right really, there with really you. Hard. I get it. I'm nine, yeah. and nine and three. Yeah. Yep. I'm right uh-huh. there with you. So having said that, yes, I've been crying, but also I've been focused on what I can do. So like, I, I want to, I started with, I've cried because I don't want it to be like, it's been, I mean, it's fine. I just focus my energy on what matters most. Like, <laughs> Yes, shit. I have, but it's been freaking hard. You know what I mean? So like, let's not pretend like it's been whatever. Also, I have to say for me, this wasn't as hard because I chose this life before the pandemic. My kids were at home. I was, the, do, I was the, the adjustment period calls. wasn't as, as great. No, for, as other I, I already did. I'd already been on conference calls, wiping someone's ass without anybody else knowing it. Cause <laughs> I would hide my screen. Like I've already done that. It wasn't yeah, new you only for see me, from, you know? you only see from here. Up. Yeah. I, there's so many things happening here. You don't know about Adam oh. and it's just fine. You know you what just I mean? Don't, don't, don't ask. Don't tell. I, I, I love All that one. All you need to see is this. Yes. It, it, um, exactly. So I've already done this. So for me, it wasn't as much of a huge shift. And I really felt for the parents that didn't ask for it, didn't want it, didn't, you know, whatever that's hard. 
Right. I mean, think about it. Some people are just not productive. They can't be productive at home for the type of job, the type of work, the type of focus and energy they need. They can't have freaking screaming kids all over the place. Of course you can't. It's so hard. I mean, I worked in a, I've been working in a closet for the past two years because I have to have a door that no one can see me. So, but it goes back to focus on what is in your control. There is shit you can't control and don't spend your time or energy on it. Focus on what is within your control. And if all of a sudden you're only focusing on what's in your control, you move a hell of a lot faster. You get a lot more accomplished because you're not worrying about things out of your control. I love it. So let let me ask you this. Um, You're you're close with Jesse Itzler and Sarah Blakely. What what have you learned from them as as a power couple? What What have you learned from having a front row seat to their life? Uh, they're awesome. They're just great humans. Um, I, I have really loved getting to know them and like, you know, I'm not, I'm not braiding Sarah's hair on the weekends or anything. So I don't want it to seem like, you know, right. whatever, but, I, but I, I have, I have, right. But I have gotten to have exchanges with them and conversations with them. And what I love is their belief in whatever they're doing. And I think that goes back to like, they believe before anything would happen. I, I, you know, I can think more back to Sarah's story and, and Spanx. She believed in what she was doing before everybody else did. Jesse believes in what he does more than anybody else's. I think their belief in what they do every day Conviction. really matters. They believe in pouring into their kids. That's why they're right there with their kids all the time. Love so it. they are so like, what you see is what you get with them as well. Like I did have the opportunity to go to their house this summer and um, so chill so real just like i like i was trying not to freak out i'm like oh my god i'm at their house what is happening this is crazy but like also then we're like just hanging out and just chatting around business and whatever they're just so they normal are, people they're so normal and i i just think they they really they do the things that they really believe in and that's what they talk about and that's what you see like what you see on instagram is what you get in real life and it's a joy and a thrill and an honor to be considered you know friends of theirs i love it i love it so let's let, let's bring it home here i i love your story um, what's what's next for Tippy Toes? What's on the horizon? A lot more Tippy Toes franchises. Uh, a lot. We are going to grow a lot, and you know, we have um, the pandemic hit us really hard. Uh, we go into schools and teach dance. You can imagine it was really, right. really hard during that. Studios time, are closing. Can't open. Oh my God. Can't be together. Yeah, I mean, we, can't even imagine. We were we were almost completely shut down for a long time. Um, during that time, corporate, what Sarah and I decided to do was double down on what we were doing, double down on who we are. We know we're good at what we do. We know mm-hmm. we offer the best dance classes. We rebranded, we focus on our processes and we are in a position now to really grow and expand. And we've changed our, you know, we've changed some things to put us in a position to grow. We're also in a different place in our life than we were 10 years ago when we started franchising. Uh, you know, we've learned all those lessons and we're really ready to get to be toes to be, uh, in just more places. So we're, we're, we are set, we are able to facilitate more new franchises, which is really exciting. So the hope and, and the plan is a lot more growth, a lot more typical franchises and, you know, and expanding. We've expanded into China in 2020, and that's been amazing and exciting to see. There's kids How's that in experience? Beijing. Did you go there? Uh, I haven't gone there. So we sold the franchise in uh February 2020. <laughs> All right. That's probably not where you want to be going during yeah. the start of the <laughs> yes. pandemic. Yeah. And so we have not been there, but they have opened up. They've got four studios they're running now and it's beautiful and wonderful. And the kids are getting that same happy, positive experience of Tippy Toes here in Share China. And I love, love it. Share the love. Yeah. Share the love. That's yeah. awesome. So a lot of growth. That's what's ahead for Tippy Toes. A lot of a lot of growth and a lot of opportunity for people that want to start a business and make some real, real money and make a real impact. The word that really kind of is rising to the top throughout this conversation is the word authentic, authenticity. I, I hear it. I feel it in everything that you're saying and doing. What does that word mean to you? You know, showing up as you are. Like, I don't, I don't, like, I hear that a lot, you know, that, I, that you are, I don't know how to not be. I don't know what that means. I can't imagine being like, hi, Adam, this is, I have, so, you know, this is, I've it all figured out. Like, it, I don't know. I, I just, I continue to show up. I, I go back to my parents. I was raised by amazing humans that love each other and support each other. And I have an amazing husband who loves me and supports me. The people I am in a safe place, a lot of my days, and that allows me to be myself. And so I don't ever feel like I have to have a guard up. And I think that's been the greatest gift of my life. And it, and um, it's made me who I am today. But I think being authentic is just knowing, you know, there's not another side of me. I do curse a heck of a lot more than I do on podcasts. That's the only thing that people don't necessarily see. But I try to keep oh, it clean every now and then. Yeah, uh-huh. it's all right. I, I, uh-huh. I, have, I, I have a potty mouth. My kids have a potty mouth. My mom, my parents mm-hmm. who were just staying with us said, 
and because my kid, my three year old cursed a couple of times and she's like, Adam, you were cursing at that age too. You grew up in Brooklyn. I mean, it's <laughs> embrace it. At least, at least teach your kids how to so, curse properly. Put how it in to the right you, context. Yeah. Right. Like if, I how will do you, say though, right? that's not what happens in Oklahoma. I was born and raised in Oklahoma oh. and you don't do that. In no, <laughs> so Bro- Brooklyn, Long Island. No, that. we got uh-huh. we a different one. Um, Megan, yeah. what is the single greatest piece of advice you've ever received that you take action on every single day? an amazing question um i have 200 of these answers i know i know and i i you know like i heard it ahead of time and i was like i really want to have a good answer but i also don't like to think ahead because (laughs) i want it to be like on the spot um you know what honestly i think it is um believe in the impossible like believe in those those things that you kind of think in your heart and you're like oh i don't really think I believe in so many big things that aren't my, the actual reality right now, but like, I know it's going to happen. And I think about my relationship with Sarah and Jesse. I think about Tippy Toes being an international franchise. I think of the, I think of my marriage. I think of like, I had these dreams of really, really amazing, wonderful things. And I've always believed in them genuinely in my soul. And and then it's when you really do genuinely believe in it, it happens. Like the whether you're manifesting, praying, whatever you want it to be. That's like the believe, secret, my friend. Believing, yeah, really believing in it, and not like fake believing, but like no, really, I believe in it. Uh, and the list of things that I believe in is really long, and there's so I'm excited. Like every day, I'm excited for what which one of those things is going to come true today. I don't know, but I'm excited for it. So I think really be- having that self belief is is crucial, and I have to have it every day. Well said, well said. And last but not least, you know, you look back on your on your life and you look back and listen, not everything is exciting. You don't wake up every morning, sunshine and rainbows. And we have those dark days. We have those dark times. We have those struggles. And those are the moments when you got to dig deep, dig deep into that ship bit and pull up and pull out and pull through with that tenacity that you have. And then on the flip side of it, Megan, right now, what you just said, just exuding gratitude and being truly mm-hmm. thankful for everything that you've manifested in your life your beautiful family, your relationships, your business. What keeps you focused? What is your compass? Megan Riley, what is your North Star in life? Um, my North Star, I would say, is treating people with kindness. Like that's, I, I want to be someone that's always a champion for people. And whether that's Sarah Blakely or whether that's a homeless person on the side of the road, like I want to be the, the champion for people. I want to have their... I want when people think of me, I want them to be like, she, she was always good to people. She always took care of people. Uh, that's what I care most about, whether that's my people, my kids, my husband, my family, people that, you know, franchise owners, our customers, like, I just want to take care of people. I want to support people and be kind to people. And I want to be a champion for people. And as my, as my, you know, business and everything has grown, one of the greatest gifts for me has been being able to pay it forward to people that are trying and trying to hustle and grind and get up. I love supporting them. So I would say it's, it's, you know, being a champion for other human beings and and caring for other people with kindness all the time. I love it. Megan Raleigh, thank you so much for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. I want everyone to check out her show, the Who Is Your Mama podcast available on all the major platforms. And please check out tippytoesdance.com. Megan Raleigh, thank you so much for joining us today. Hang with me one moment. Adam Posner, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. And to everyone listening, I hope you really enjoyed this show. If you did, please share it. Sharing means caring. It goes a long way. So does reviews and ratings. We certainly appreciate it. And you, you know where you can find more at thepodcast.com, all of our social media channels. Thank you again for listening. Remember, take care of each other. Look out for one another and catch us next week for another good episode of the podcast. Take care, everybody. Wisdom is forever. But for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.